welcome to this online event with the British Library from wherever you're watching in the world. My name is Farron Gibson and I'll be in conversation with art historian James Fox about his brand new book, The World According to Color, A Cultural History. A brilliant and often surprising exploration of something so central to the way we live and a huge part of all cultures. James will shortly give an illustrated talk about the themes of the book filmed especially for this event. And after that, he'll be joining me for a live conversation and taking your questions. If you'd like to send in a question at any point, please go to the forum just below the video screen. We'll get through as many as we can later on. During the event, if you're inspired to buy the book, and you should, please go to the books tab at the top of the screen where you'll find a link to the British Library Bookshop. Also at the top of the screen, you'll see links that will enable you to give feedback about this event or support the work of the library. Finally, a little more about uh, background about our speaker. James Fox is an art historian, broadcaster, and fellow of Gonville and Keys College, Cambridge. His many fascinating and widely acclaimed BBC television documentaries, which many of you may have seen, include programs on the history of Cornish art, British Renaissance, and the culture and politics of Vienna in 1908, Paris in 1928, and New York in 1951. Now, please enjoy this wonderful video by James. Thank you, Theron, and thank you very much, all of you, for listening to me talk about my latest book, The World According to Colour. Now, this uh, really has been a labour of love for me. I uh, first conceived it back in 2012, thinking it would be a really quick and simple project. But uh, as I began researching, many of that research done in the British Library, in fact, uh, the subject got bigger and bigger and the research went on and on. And in the end, I think I spent about eight years working on this book. Um, though in some ways I've been working on it since I was a child. Um, and I know that's a strange thing to say, but uh, I first truly fell in love with colour at the age of six. And I remember very vividly what happened. It was a hot day. I was sitting in my parents' kitchen, was drinking some orange juice, when this huge fly came in through the window and rattled around the room for several minutes. And when eventually it landed on the table, my mum rolled up a magazine and crushed it beneath the magazine. And I did what any child would do. I leant in to examine the carcass, which was spasming in a, a pool of body fluid. And of course, my initial response was disgust. Um, but then I started to look at it closely. And I noticed the colours of that fly were just exceptional. The, the, the abdomen was a sort of sapphire blue and emerald green. The eyes were burgundy. The wings were like little rainbows. And I remember so vividly thinking, well, look, if something as insignificant and small and ugly as a fly is actually this beautiful and this full of colour close up, I really start, should start looking more closely at everything else. And that is exactly what I did. I, over the following weeks, over the following months, over the following years, I scrutinised the colours of pretty much everything that I encountered. So I remember counting the reds in the rose petals, I counted the greys in the clouds, and I even discovered a few years later that if I, in the middle of the night when it was pitch black, if I closed my eyes and jabbed my eyelids extremely hard, I could summon these extraordinary colours and patterns out of the darkness. We, we, we call them phosphenes, in fact, and I highly recommend people doing it themselves. It's quite an extraordinary experience. So we can see colour and light in the darkness. But the more I looked, the the more questions I guess I had, um, you know, why, for instance, was the sea blue, but seawater colourless? Why did cooked beef turn red and cooked chicken turn white? Why did we say that white spirit and white wine and white people, for that matter, were white when clearly they weren't white? And I think it was that curiosity about colour that ultimately led me to become an art historian. And even today, you know, every time I look at the, the blues of Islamic architecture or the incredible myriad blacks of Chinese and Japanese ink wash painting or the dazzling reds of Henri Matisse, I do feel like I am um, indulging a, a childhood addiction. But anyway, before I get started, I think we really must answer a pretty fundamental question. And that, that question is, what is colour? Well, in some ways, I'm reminded here of um, the US Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart, who back in the 1960s, he had to decide whether something was pornography or not. And he concluded really quite famously by saying, well, I can't define pornography, but I know it when I see it. And, you know, I think that 
The very same thing is true of colour. We all see colour all the time. We all know what it is. We know the difference between red and blue and yellow and green. But as soon as we have to define it, we run into trouble. And that is because despite its ubiquity, despite its ever presence, colour is actually a really mysterious entity that raises all kinds of difficult philosophical questions. And I think the main debate, I suppose, is whether colour exists out in the world, in light and in things, or whether it exists inside us, in our brains. In other words, whether colour is objective or subjective. Now, of course, common sense tells us that colour is objective, that, it, that objects, this cup that I'm drinking, this has a kind of colour in it that is there whether we look at it or not. But actually, that's very often not the case. I've got here a little prop. This is one of my prized possessions. This is a, um, a Ulysses butterfly from Australasia. It's one of the most famous and very rare blue creatures in the world. But when scientists actually ground down and examined the wings, they discovered there wasn't a single piece of blue pigment in it. It was all an optical illusion designed to make us think it is blue. And of course, what's more than that, we all see colors differently. Many men are colorblind, so they see fewer colors than other people. Uh, there are some women who, by virtue of a sort of rare chromosomal condition, might be able to see hundreds, if not millions of more colors than anyone else. And even if those of us with normal color vision uh, see things differently, I'm sure many of you will remember a few years ago when that photograph of a dress uh, went uh, surfaced online and it became a huge viral thing. Well, I probably shouldn't use the word viral in the same way anymore, but it became a, a huge viral sensation. And the reason was, because the world, people couldn't agree whether that dress in that photograph was blue and black or white and gold. And I think in doing so, it, it became a perfect example of how much of colour resides in the eyes of the beholder, how much of it is about the way that our retinas and our brains make sense of the waves of light, the photons that vibrate and, and bounce and rattle around us on this planet. And colour isn't only a visual phenomenon. You know, colours affect our minds and our bodies in all kinds of ways. Uh, they help us understand when to go to sleep and when to wake up, what to eat, what to buy, who to find attractive, uh, what emotions to feel. So they're constantly shaping our moods and our behaviours all the time, even though we're not always aware of them doing so. So red, for instance, uh, is a good example. Red has been found to to raise heart rates, to increase electrical activity in the brain, to contribute to sexual arousal, to improve the body's strength, speed and reaction time. We even know from a number of studies that, that sports teams or athletes wearing red strips are at an advantage by virtue of wearing red. And blue, by contrast, is being found to reduce heart rates and blood pressure, to promote relaxation, to reduce crime, to reduce levels of suicide. And so, it's a fascinating, myriad, amorphous, protean entity colour, but my book tells the story of human culture, all of human culture in some ways, through colour. So it begins with the origins of the universe 13.8 billion years ago, and it runs all the way through to the environmental crisis we currently face, and it covers societies on every different continent. Now, I focus on seven major colours, black, red, yellow, blue, uh, white, purple, and green. And I use each of them to tap into a particular phase or theme in human history, because our culture has been intimately connected with colour from the very beginning. We have used it as a symbol, as a metaphor, as a language, I suppose, uh, to communicate the most important ideas we have. And what I thought I'd do over the next 20 minutes or so is essentially to try and do, I know it sounds pretty ambitious in 20 minutes, but to try and do a potted history of humanity through some of these colors. Um, so let's begin at the beginning because in many respects, the first really salient color in human culture was red. Now, maybe this shouldn't surprise us because of course, after all, beneath the surface, all of us are made from red meat and red blood. And it's a color that we have always associated with ourselves. And, you only need to think back on early creation myths, you know, stories that talk about the first creations of humans. And there are many different stories from all over the world, all with different narratives. But many of them, many of them uh, stipulate 
that the first humans had been molded out of red materials, whether it was red clay or red sand or red dust. In fact, this is one of the reasons why the first human of the Old Testament was called Adam, because Adam in Hebrew means red, as well as earth and blood, the materials from which he was made. And I think what's so fascinating for me about this is that this, this isn't simply a matter of myth. Archaeologists who are studying some of the earliest human societies in Stone Age Africa have consistently found something remarkable. Everywhere they look, every site they go to, they find huge amounts of red pigments. So a few years ago in South Africa, for instance, archaeologists found an astonishing site. They found what they believe to be a 100,000-year-old pigment workshop three times as old as the cave paintings, where pigments were being manufactured. Red ochre was being brought from a quarry and processed and turned into paint. And they even discovered on, on this piece of red ochre, one of the very first abstract designs ever made by humans. Now, by the time of the Upper Paleolithic, when the famous cave paintings were being made in Europe, red pigments were being used in figurative artworks. And one of the really interesting things about that is that these figures were themselves in some ways colour coded. So in Chauvet Cave, for instance, which was discovered by accident by some explorers in the 1990s, what we find is that animals are typically depicted in black charcoal and humans in the form of these palm prints and the hand stencils are typically depicted in red pigments. So this is a particularly interesting image. You can see that the black line is the back of a of a bison that has been drawn in black. And then on top of that, or just within that, we can see the human presence marked out with red. So clearly there was some color coding with our species. Um, so what did red mean? You know, why did we go to all these lengths to gain it? What were we doing with it? I mean, the truth is, we don't really know. I mean, it's so long ago, we don't have many records, but most anthropologists think that red was a symbol of blood and that like blood, it symbolized life and death. They think it was smeared over women's bodies to symbolize fertility. We know for sure that it was buried with the dead, probably to bring them back to life, and that it would also have been applied to places and objects to invest them with a life force associated with blood. So it's entirely possible that red was humanity's very first symbol, representing that most important process of life and death. And we know that in many indigenous communities around the world, even today, red pigments are still being applied to bodies and objects because of their spiritual power, because of their life force. Now, it's, I think, important to say that in, in prehistoric times, we didn't have that many colours to choose from. Uh, we mostly had blacks and whites and yellows and browns and reds, the so-called earth colours, because they could be easily extracted from the earth. But in later centuries, in the Neolithic period especially, we devised a whole new range of pigments and dyes, and those colours became extremely important commodities, luxuries and status symbols. And perhaps the most luxurious of them all, and the one that most people will have heard of, is Tyrian purple. Now this dye was made around 1500 BC onwards in the Near East, uh, and it was made from shellfish. And what would happen is you would catch the shellfish, you would take their, their glands out, you would extract the mucus, then you could boil that mucus in salt water for several weeks. Apparently it was the most unbearable stench that the, uh, the process emitted. And it was highly labor intensive. You needed somewhere in the region of 10,000 mollusks to produce just a gram of dye. And this made it extremely expensive. So I found, for instance, in the process of my research, a fourth century Roman price list, uh, the price list of Diocletian, which listed all the prices of all the commodities in fourth century Rome. And um, what I discovered was that uh, a pound of Tyrian purple silk was more than twice as expensive as gold by weight and five times the price of a, of a male slave. That's how expensive it was. And in fact, as I trolled through this text, I found that there was only one item on this list that was as expensive as a pound of uh, Tyrian silk. And that was a male lion, lion that had to be captured and imported uh, from Africa. So this dye obviously naturally became a, a status symbol. And it was very quickly became associated really only with imperial rulers. And under Theodosius II, for instance, anyone found buying 
or making or wearing or even owning this extraordinary purple colour without permission could be charged with treason, which was a crime punishable by death. Now, different cultures prize different colours for different reasons. So um, in China, for instance, red became established as the most celebrated colour, uh, in part because Chinese philosophers had given it these bold, bright and very auspicious connotations. And, and those associations remain absolutely with us today. Chinese people string up red lanterns to celebrate a new year. They decorate their front doors with red paper to ward off bad luck. They give newborn babies red clothes. Um, you see that Chinese restaurants often have red signs. Uh, Chinese products, chili oils, for instance, often have red labels because it's a, a color of good luck. And the meanings of red are so positive in China that the Chinese stock market shows rising stocks in red rather than black, which is the opposite of almost every other country. Um, in South Asia, by contrast, it was yellow really that emerged as the most desirable color. And in India, for instance, yellow colorants, and they had many, but yellow colorants, including saffron and turmeric, were linked to Buddhist monks and Hindu gods. And turmeric in particular is still used, widely used, in fact, in marriage rituals. So in many parts of India, you will splash turmeric over the bride and groom, over their clothes, over the wedding invitations, over the guests, over the food, uh, all to bring about good luck for the, for the wedding in the future. And in Islamic cultures, the Middle East, uh, green, I think it was the color uh, that reigned supreme. It was said to be Muhammad's favorite color. The Hadith tells us that he wore green a lot, that he talked about green vegetation a lot. Um, the Quran tells us quite explicitly that paradise itself was green, that it was filled with green plants, with green cushions, that people who lived there wore green clothes. And in fact, not many people know that the shortest verse in the whole of the Quran is just one word long, and that word is green. It's a specific kind of deep, dark, rich green that exists only on the trees in paradise itself. So what of Europe then? Uh, well, I mean, I think unlike the people of Asia, Europeans didn't particularly like yellow. Uh, since antiquity and certainly throughout the Middle Ages, they linked it to all kinds of outcasts. So we often see artists painting Judas, the, the apostle who obviously portrayed Christ in yellow garments. And officials, meanwhile, often made prostitutes, debtors, heretics, and of course, most famously, Jews, wear yellow garments or symbols to mark them out as other. And of course, this is something the Nazis revived in the early 1940s, that in, 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 insisting that Jews in particular wear these yellow badges. But the color that emerged, I suppose, with, with most credit in medieval Europe was blue. Now, blue is a really funny one because blue is now the most popular color in the world. In every single color country, survey after survey shows that blue is by far the most popular color by a huge margin. 30 or 40 percent of people rate blue as their favorite color. But it actually played a very marginal role in earlier societies. Um, it was one of the last basic colors uh, to be named in every human language. For much of history, people didn't even have a word for it. So it's well known, for instance, that Homer of Iliad and Odyssey fame uh, never once used the word blue. He called the, the blue Mediterranean Sea, he called it wine dark instead. And we see a similar absence in, in art and culture as well. You know, the thing about blue is that though blue is everywhere in some ways, we have blue skies and blue seas and blue horizons, there are actually very few tangible blue things in nature. There are very few blue plants or blue minerals, blue animals. And so because of that, it became very, very difficult to manufacture really good blue colors. Uh, by the Middle Ages, there were some blue dyes. There was indigo and woad, for instance. There were some blue pigments, azurite and cobalt, but none of them were quite right. And it was only really in the second half of the Middle Ages when uh, Europeans, I think, discovered this new blue pigment that surpassed even Tyrian purple uh, for splendor. And I think everyone knows what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this product called 
lapis lazuli. This was an extremely rare stone that for much of its history could only be found in one mountain in Afghanistan. And, you know, lapis lazuli really does look, when you look at it raw as it comes out of the, the quarry, it really looks like a fragment of the sky. It's got this beautiful deep blue uh, celestial colour. It's got these white calcite clouds, these golden pyrite stars. So it really does look like a, a fragment of the firmament. And Europeans were convinced that this, this celestial stone had miraculous properties. So they, they used it, almost always unsuccessfully, it must be said, to uh, heal warts and ulcers, to manage menstruation and urinary tract infections, to treat fevers and cataracts and depression. And of course, it was also the sole source of this exceptional blue pigment. Although extracting that pigment from this very impure stone was extremely difficult. So around 1200, this new recipe emerges that involves grinding the stone into a powder, mixing it with resin and gum and linseed oil and wax to form a dough, kneading the dough for several days, then submerging it in an eye solution and then trying desperately to get only the blue bits out of the solution. But when they did that, after days and days of work, the results were extraordinary. And, and the product, when finished, was given what is probably the most, I suppose, evocative name in the history of colour. It was called Azzurro Ultramarino, um, ultramarine, as we know, which in Italian meant overseas, because the raw material lapis lazuli came from a long way away in Afghanistan. And like other exotic products, like Tyrian purple, it did not come cheap. It, you know, it cost up to 100 times more than other pigments on the market. In fact, I did some more digging to try to work out the, the, the prices. And I found that in 1515, the Florentine artist Andrea del Sarto paid five florins for an ounce of ultramarine. Uh, and I did some calculations and I worked out that that equated, just for one ounce of ultramarine, that equated to five years rent for a labourer living outside the city. So that gives you an impression of how out of reach some of the most exotic pigments once were for ordinary people. Now, the most famous use of ultramarine in history uh, is probably this barnstorming painting in the National Gallery, um, Titian's Bacchus and Ariadne. And it captures the explosive moment when Bacchus, leading this ragbag of revelers, first sets eyes on a heartbroken Ariadne. She has just been abandoned by Theseus, who on the left of the picture sails off across the horizon without her. Bacchus falls instantly in love with her. He marries her on the spot. He transforms her into a deity like himself. So it's an exuberant and romantic picture, but I think its popularity, its enduring popularity, is above all owed to colour. As Titian was given a huge amount of money by his patron to, to, to paint this picture, so he spent it on the most expensive pigments that money could buy in 16th century Venice. So we have them all here on on the canvas. So the, the trees are made from a very expensive green called malachite green. There's a little yellow cloth in the foreground called uh, it's made from the very highest, uh, best lead tin yellow. The oranges are made from realgar and orpiment, these beautiful, exotic, expensive, but quite toxic oranges from China. The finest crimson is used on Bacchus's cloak. The finest vermilion is used on Ariadne's sash. And of course, the, the, the king of colours in this picture is ultramarine, uh, which covers, what, almost a third of the canvas, the, the, the blue sky. And it is actually, as far as scholars have worked out, it's one of the purest examples of the pigment ever discovered in the history of art. So the cost alone would have been astronomical. And it must have been so exciting for Titian to be able to take this elusive colour of the sky and the sea and this extraordinarily luxurious, expensive product and then to, to use it with such abundance in his art. And yet, in some ways, despite the, despite the obvious delights of colour, some Europeans of Titian's generation had already started to, I suppose, turn their backs on colour by this stage. Uh, many of them had been inspired by the rediscovery of ancient Greek and Roman statues. Now, Greek and Roman statues, as we all know now, were originally brightly coloured. But over the years, they lost those colours. And when they were rediscovered in the, in the Renaissance and in the, in the, in the uh, subsequent centuries, most of them were back to their sort of plain, unadorned, pale marble. 
And I think because of this, a number of artists, and Michelangelo is a famous example, started to advance this aesthetic of whiteness, that plain whitish things were the best things to make. And of course, since ancient times, white had been associated with moral and spiritual and physical purity. But in Europe, really from the 16th century onwards and growing in the 17th and 18th centuries, um, it also became associated with good taste. Uh, so, you know, many philosophers, many theorists repeatedly argued that bright colours were, were childish, feminine, primitive, while simple white things were, were really noble and sophisticated. Now, it was a completely ludicrous assertion, but I think in some ways it, it, it does remain with us because, I, you know, I think we still do harbour a view that a minimalist white interior or an austere abstraction or a colourless white device uh, or appliance is somehow, is somehow classier than one that comes in gaudy and garish colours. We still, I think, believe ultimately, it, with regard to colour at least, that less is more. Um, but of course, it's important to say that, you know, the European taste for whiteness didn't only have aesthetic, uh, aesthetic consequences, it had huge social and political ramifications as well, particularly with regard to race. Maybe that's something we can discuss later on. Now, if Europeans went through a period of what some have called chromophobia, this fear of colour, this resistance to colour, through the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, really by the 19th century, they'd very much emphatically come out of it. Now, there have only been, I think, a few real, um, how can I put it, quantum leaps in the history of colour. So one might have come in ancient Egypt, perhaps in medieval China, perhaps in Renaissance Venice. But perhaps the most fundamental leap of all took place actually in 1850s Europe and probably, to be more specific, 1850s London, because that was when the modern chemists and the, the sort of canny businessmen of the Industrial Revolution worked together to completely transform the range of colours available to us. And I think that breakthrough moment is often believed to have come in the spring of 1856, when an 18-year-old amateur chemist called William Henry Perkin conducted, was conducting some experiments in his parents' spare room in Shadwell, when he by mistake invented this extraordinarily bright purple synthetic dye. Now, he originally named it Tyrian purple, as you would, um, but by the beginning of 1858, he was mass producing the product under the name Mauve. Now, mauve became a sensation. You know, Queen Victoria started wearing it. Empress Eugenie started wearing it. Then the, the aristocracy started wearing it. Then the middle classes. And by 1859, it was everywhere. It was being likened to a contagious disease. Punch magazine was uh, writing about um, uh, mauve mania. You know, it was being used in morning suits and school uniforms and, and, and wallpapers and leather-bound books and sweets and confectionery. Even billions of postage stamps were being printed in mauve. And I think it's interesting because for so long, purple, like blue to some extent, had been this rare, luxurious colour, a colour that was really hard to produce. But in the 1860s, all kinds of purples or purpley synthetic dyes appeared, from mauve to magenta to regina purple to palmer violet. And you know something, we, we often think that the past is less colourful than the present partly because I think we're so used to seeing it in black and white photographs. Um, but I think the inventions of the 1850s and 60s give the lie to such assumptions. They remind us that the 19th century was saturated with colour, and particularly purple. And by the end of the 19th century, purple, um, which was once an ancient imperial colour with all those connotations of Tyrian purple, had become a symbol, really important symbol, I think, of the Industrial Revolution itself, for good and for bad. So, you know, on the one hand, it captured the brilliance and ingenuity of modern science and manufacturing. But on the other hand, it epitomized a world of capitalist extravagance and toxic chemicals. And so that is why in the years around 1900, you start to see people really associating purple with pollution, with toxicity. I mean, there's one book I discuss uh, in, in, in my book, uh, a remarkable novel called The Purple Cloud, written by a very strange man called M.P. Scheel, I think in 1901. Uh, it describes this huge purple cloud that spreads across the world and kills pretty much the entire human population. So there's a real sense 
of purple being toxic by the end of the 19th century and being a form of pollution. Uh, although not everyone was worried. Um, you know, Claude Monet, for instance, for his part, he traveled to London to paint the pollution, to paint the purple smog he saw hanging over the city. And he thought it was one of the most beautiful things he had ever witnessed. I think this brings us quite smoothly to uh, the final color in my book and this talk, I think, and the color I think that in many respects represents the defining issue of our own time. Because the industrialization of human society I've just discussed had, as we all know now, a momentous impact on our planet and one that's growing with every passing year. The color green, of course, has, has long been associated with nature, more for more than a billion years, in fact, because chlorophyll, the pigment responsible for photosynthesis in plants, is green. Um, but it's really only in the last 50 years or so that we have come to identify the color green, the color of chlorophyll, with the environmental crisis, the environmental revolution. You know, the so-called green movement has been gathering momentum since the late 1960s, early 1970s, and it's now virtually impossible to avoid green's environmental connections. We are perpetually advised, aren't we, to buy green, to go green, to think green. And I think really green has become a key word of our times, an ideology of our times, loaded in the way that, that gender or sexuality or nation, or race or ethnicity are. But it's funny though, when we, when we think of climate change, we typically think of the world becoming less green and yet the opposite so far is the case because over the last 35 years or so, uh, largely as a result of warming temperatures and rising CO2 levels, 18 million square kilometers of new vegetation has appeared on this planet. That's an area roughly twice the size of the United States. So the earth surprisingly is greener today than it has been for millennia, for all the wrong reasons, of course, but it is greener today than it has been for many thousands of years. Although what color it will turn in the long run remains uh, deeply uncertain and will in part depend on how we change our behavior. I fear I have uh, pretty much run out of time, but I thought I would just conclude by, by trying to say, what do I hope readers will take from this book? Well, above all, I think I want readers and anyone to look at the world more closely uh, as a result of reading this book. You know, the philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, he once said that um, the hardest things to see are the things we see every day. And I think color is one of those things. Uh, it's uh, so ubiquitous, it's so much a part of life. And technology has made colors so plentiful and so easily reproduced that we take color for granted. You know, we can buy products in almost any color we like. Uh, home decorators have so many colors to choose from that, that they can't even have sensible names for them. You know, think of elephant's breath, for instance. Um, and I've got one other example here. This is my son's box of crayons. Let me open it. There you are. A few centuries ago, a product like this which reproduces pretty much every color in the spectrum and lines it up and puts it in a box that you can buy, would have sent alchemists and emperors into raptures. Artists would have gone crazy for it. People might have fought wars over it. Nowadays, it's little more than a children's toy. So I do hope that after reading this book, people will find more wonder in their surroundings, even in banal things like boxes of crayons or the myriad greens in a piece of broccoli or the shades of brown on a flat white or indeed the, 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 the colors of a, an annoying fly. And I think in the end, we should never forget that we as humans are ultimately inseparable from color because every hue we see around us is actually manufactured within us. It's manufactured in the same gray matter that, that forms our language, that stores our memories, that stokes emotions, that shapes thoughts, that gives rise to consciousness itself. And to pardon the pun, color is a pigment of the imagination that we paint all over the world. And I think it might well be the greatest human creation of them all. Thank you. That was such a fascinating conversation that covered so many different areas. Um, and before I get into my own questions with James, I just want to remind everyone to please do send through your questions down below.
Um, so yeah, let's get right into it because there's so many different things to cover and it's just, it's just really interesting. Um, the first thing I, I noticed is that there was one color of the kind of main colors of the rainbow, I guess, that was missing and that's orange. And I was just wondering if you could explain why maybe orange didn't make the cut. I would have loved to write about orange. I would have loved to write about gray. I would have loved to write about brown. Um, but in the end, I, I made the decision that uh, the number of chapters I wanted to write was seven. And I did that for a reason. I did that because I think seven is a particularly meaningful color in human history. You think of uh, you know the seven days of the week, the seven ages of man, the seven cardinal sins, the seven virtues, and of course the seven colors that Isaac Newton uh, identified on the spectrum. So I thought seven had to, seven felt like the right color, uh, the, the right number of colors to choose. Um, but what I did try to do uh, where possible was to allude to other colors within those colors I'd chosen. So my chapter on yellow does deal with quite a lot of orangey substances. So I deal with saffron, for instance, which is probably more orange than it is yellow. I deal with gold, which is, uh, you know, not strictly yellow either. And in purple, I deal with colours all the way through from magenta through to indigo. So I do try to allude to the broader range of colours. But, you know, this book took me so long to write. Had I added some extra chapters, I think, you know, it'd have been another 10 years to write it. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, sorry. Um, so I guess now I think it would be interesting to talk about um, colors and relationships to maybe some artists. So, for example, you mentioned Titian, Spockus, and Ariadne, and there's so many colors in there, um, aside from the blue that you mentioned that are really interesting. And I also have heard of Titian Red, which is, um, he's associated with that hair color um, that he used in his work is, is now a name for that. Um, and I'm just wondering, are there other artists that come to mind if someone says, ah, oh, blue, red, black, um, that artists that work are known to work with those colours? Yes, I think that I think many artists have had colour preferences, as we all do. I mean, I, one of the one of the most fascinating things I discovered in, 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 in my research was in an archive, uh, a manuscript, a piece of paper that from the 1860s that um, recorded the outcome of a... Uh, uh, an after dinner game that was played quite a lot in the Victorian period and this game was called My Favourite Things and what would happen is you would bombard a particular person with a series of quick fire questions saying what's your favourite food, what are your favourite clothes, what is your favourite activity and um, and one of the, the people who played this game was the very great Victorian artist Ford Maddox Brown and at one point he was asked what's your favourite colour and he wrote magenta uh, which was actually a very new colour. It had only been invented a few years earlier. And when you actually look at Ford Maddox Brown's work, you see a lot of magenta in his work. Uh, one of his fam most famous paintings is The Last of England. It's got the most incredible magenta ribbon in it that took him four weeks to paint on its own. And so I think that you do find a number of artists being identified with certain colours through history, particularly in the modern period. So Turner admitted you know, that, that yellow was his favourite colour. Uh, the Impressionists, I've already shown Monet, but the Impressionists were, were famed for their association with violets and purples. Um, Manet was a big fan of black, as he was inspired by Velasquez, who was also a fan of black. And then in the 20th century, you get artists with real monomanias devoted to, to particular colours. So you, you could think of, you know, Ben Nicholson's whites and uh, Robert Ryman's whites and, um, uh, you know, Ad Reinhardt's blacks, um, Pierre Soulages' blacks, um, Eve Klein blue, Gustav Klimt's golds. So I think that as you go through time, particularly in the modern period, artists are um, often particularly um, uh, affectionate towards specific colours. Not always, but some are. Yeah, and Klein Blue is definitely one of the first one that, that comes to your mind. He, mm. he got his name on a colour, you know, mm. and it's still to this day quite hard to get your hands on a true kind of ultramarine blue. It's still an expensive colour to get. Yes, I mean, you know, Klein was a huge fan of ultramarine, a huge fan of blue, and um, but he felt that there were some problems with it. So actually, ultramarine, which I talked about, which was very hard to get, very hard to make, in the early 1800s, there was a competition in France to try and create a synthetic version of ultramarine, and, and someone did ultimately crack, several people actually at the same time, cracked this synthetic ultramarine. That's the colour we still use today. When you see in your box of oil paints, you see ultramarine. Marine, that's synthetic yeah. ultramarine. But Eve Klein felt that 
when you actually put that pigment on, on canvas, it was slightly deader than he wanted it to be. So he spent a year in the late 1950s uh, with a remarkable legendary color man called Edouard Adam to try and devise a new way of suspending that pigment so that the whole thing was more, was more resonant and uh, vibrant. And when you do actually see IKB blue, the, the, the color that he patented, I think in 1959, it is just so explosive and resonant. It's the most it's magnificent nearly, blue. It's nearly neon. I mean, mm. it's not quite a neon, but there's, there's like a, yeah, you, you know, the way that neon colors have a glow to them, I find that true ultramarine has that sort of glow to it. It really does. And when you look at those paintings closely, and he applied them in very clever ways to enhance the effect. But when you look at those paintings, I mean, your retina can't really land on the color. It's so it's so um, oscillating and vibrating that it's uh, it's quite an unsettling experience, but a, but a magnificent experience as well. It sounds to me that um, describing what you find in the blue and um, the mauve and things like that, also the processes that you describe, it sounds like very hard work. Like, I mean, boiling all those mollusks and all of those things. <laughs> were were um, the people creating these pigments very precious about their recipes? Because it sounds like it's a real commodity, a lot of money to be made if you're the only person that knows how to make this desirable color. Absolutely. Before, you know, we've got to remember that for most of history, you couldn't just go to a shop and buy a box of mass produced paint. You, you, you were often making it yourself in your workshop. You had your own specific recipe that might have been passed down by uh, your, your, you know, by your ancestors, and you would guard it jealously. And it was an important part of your intellectual property. It was a part of your signature style as an artist. And so people really, really were very possessive about their colors. In the 19th century, when we, when we see the emergence of mauve and all those purples. I mean, it was unbelievable the amount of court cases that took place to try for when people tried to stop other people using their recipes or mass pr or producing their colors without permission. There are, I mean, I've actually in, uh, described some of those court cases uh, in, in the book. And of course, this process, this, this kind of competition still goes on today. I remember a few years ago, uh, the British sculptor Anish Kapoor got into real trouble when he signed an exclusivity deal with a company for the so-called blackest black ever made. So he went down there to the fact, I actually went down to see this product myself to the factory and it's an incredible black. Um, and he signed this deal with them so no other artist could use it. And of course this made artists furious. So it's still happening even today. Yeah, that's the Vanta black, is that right? Vanta black, So yes. you ha you've seen it in person. I have seen it in person. I went down shortly after it for the research of this book, actually, and uh, shortly after they'd, they'd announced it. It's a very strange, it's not really even a pigment, it's a material that is uh, grown in a very dense, uh, like a very dense forest of nanotubes. And they're so dense that when light uh, hits them, the light gets yeah. trapped between the carbon nanotubes and hardly any of that light comes back. And um, when you see it next to another black product, you are, uh, it, it makes the other black project product look gray by comparison, it's that dark. Yeah, you know, that's interesting that you mentioned that about shades black, because I think it's one of those colors that you think of as being like, how can there be shades? If there are shades, then it's gray, right? Um, mm. But if you've ever like tried to mix and match black clothes, you know very well that there are these undertones and things. So that's actually really interesting to think about, Shays. Did you talk much about that in the book? Yes, I mean, black is the, I think, the most misunderstood color in some ways, and that so often people think of it as a, as a, as a, as a, as a non-color. Um, as a, as a, as a form of darkness, you know, they think of black as pitch dark. The truth is, it's not, it's not dark, really. I mean, actually, the, the color of pitch darkness, absolute darkness, is not black, it is grey. So if you go into a room and there is absolutely no light, you see something called eigengrau, you see something called brain grey. Black is actually a contrast effect, so in order to have blackness you need to have light uh, to create that contrast. So that was one of, that's one of the biggest misunderstandings of all, is that black is an absence of light. You need light to see black. And of course, as many artists have shown, uh, you think of uh, artists like um, Pierre Soulage, as I've mentioned before, he's someone who shows that color with black, which contains all the colors, is the most yeah. unbelievably luscious, rich, generous color of all. And I should say that people people knew this before. People, you know, the, the very word black 
it originates in the Proto-Indo-European word bleg, which means shine or bright or gleam. Uh, so black, you know, even, even, the, even in terms of our language, it's linked to brightness and light. That's so interesting because like you say, everyone thinks of it as the opposite. So that mm. is really interesting. Um, so you mentioned Wing Mo, you called it like a, a quantum leap. Um, and I'm wondering, are there other moments uh, that stand out in your mind that you researched and wrote about that um, really felt like big advances in color development? Yeah, as I say, as I said in my talk, then they're not that many. There, I would say there are there are a handful of moments when we make this great leap forward in terms of how many colors we can produce. I think the first one is probably right at the beginning when humans first start creating pigments. They first start burning woods and stones and bones to make charcoal. They start excavating and processing red ochre. Then you get in the Neolithic period the development of uh, colors like vermilion in Spain and indigo in South America and um, and uh, Egyptian blue in ancient Egypt, an early synthetic blue, Han purple in China. Um, and then you get ma massive developments in dye manufacturing in Venice, in the late Middle Ages, in the Renaissance. And then of course, in the 19th century, I've mentioned it already, you get the synthetic revolution, when you get all these extraordinary pigments that are being manufactured in the lab. And these are the pigments, these are the dyes that we still use today. You know, as I say, you know, if you find an ultramarine in your paint palette, that's a synthetic ultramarine. If you see your genes are dyed with indigo, that's synthetic indigo that was invented in the 19th century. Um, so I think that the synthetic revolution is the one that, that, that shapes, I mean, it's the one that has dyed all the colors on those beautiful books uh, behind you, Farah, and those are all synthetic colors. Yeah, um, the, the, as you were talking, and especially when you were talking about um, purple and toxicity and things, it made me think, how many of these colors and pigments were poisonous? Because you mm. hear about women um, putting on makeup and like, like uh, Queen Elizabeth maybe to get the white on her face mm. and that it was like poisonous. So is, was there a bit of danger involved? Oh yes, of course. I mean, many of yeah. these colors were, were, were made from various toxic chemicals that greens were particularly toxic. I mean, it's, it's quite an irony actually that green uh, synthetic dyes that we use today are some of the, the, the least environmentally friendly. So all those recyclable green bags um, that, that are supposed to be good for the planet are actually pretty bad compared oh, yeah. to various other pigments <laughs> because they use a lot of chlorine to make them. Uh, lead white is the most famous uh, toxic white and you know killed many people people put this white on their skin uh, and on their bodies and they painted their houses in it and uh, you know that was found to be toxic realgar and orpiment uh, which i mentioned in the titian those had arsenic in them uh, vermilion beautiful red had arsenic uh, in it as well so lots of these pigments were, for, were were made from chemicals that that weren't necessarily very good for us so interesting to think of how um in a way, because as you mentioned, it's all around, you almost, um, if you're a person who you know, sees, sees all the colors, just take them for granted. Uh, mm. But then you start to hear the kind of risk involved in mm. producing the colors, the amount of money that went into um, acquiring the colors. It's like this quietly very important cultural thing that's happening, but also kind of not really talked about that much as it did for you in terms of needing to <laughs> then write, mm. write this book. and. Talk about absolutely that. Yeah, yeah absolutely i think maybe we can take some questions um let's see what we have here someone says loving this thank you um do we see a rise in mentioned citations usages of the word blue this question is from benji in europe that corresponds with the arrival and growth of lapis lazuli based on pigments well not not necessarily then however one of the things i um i discovered in uh, my research was i was able to with regard to a sort of a, uh, with the help of a phd thesis from from the 19th century was able to do this calculation and there are two graphs in the book uh, that show how the uh, incidence the number of uses of blue in english in english literature uh, in novels and poetry rose dramatically from the 15th, 14th, 15th century to the Romantic period. So Chaucer hardly ever uses the word blue. 
Shakespeare uses a little bit more, but by the time you get to Byron and Keats and Shelley, it's, it's one of the most, if not the most, oft used colours. So I think you do see a massive rise in the, the, the use of the, the colour, the word blue, uh, throughout this period. I don't think it's due to ultramarine. I think it's due to uh, probably broader cultural phenomena about describing nature and describing skies. It's also about the word just becoming more common. As I said before, you know, blue arrives very late in most languages, and there are still many languages around the world that don't have a word for blue yet, uh, or don't have a word for blue uh, at all. Um, so uh, it takes time to get to get the, the, the word for the colour blue. But then obviously, as I said, with regard to the, um, the popularity, blue then takes over everything. Well, it makes you wonder, how do you come up with a name for something that's never had a name? Mm. Um, I guess some some languages are still wondering that. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's what my my theory is. The reason it comes late is you don't need to name it. I mean, if 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 you're not dealing with blue things in your life uh, in, yeah. in nature on a regular basis, uh, but you're but but the sky is blue and the sea is blue. You don't need to name those things as blue. You can call them the sky. You can call them the sea. But it's when you're actually manipulating and dealing with things and making distinctions between things that's when you need color terms, whether it's dark and light or red fruit and yellow fruit or particular kinds of green leaves or not. I think of color, I guess, in a hierarch hierarchical way in terms of their primary colors. So red, blue, yellow, it feels like that's the starting point because the other colors come from a combination of that. So to think that blue it's kind of like at the end, it's, it's interesting. Well, culturally speaking, anthropologists will tell you that the primary colors are black, white, and red. These are the colors that are the kind of, the, if you like, the fundamental archetypal colors in human culture. They are the first three colors we get, we, that human language gives names to. And all the others, green, yellow, blue, purple, elephant's breath, um, they come later on in, in society. Yeah. Elephant's breath, way later, yeah. way later. <laughs> much, much later. <laughs> Um, all right, let's do another question. Um, has your research on color caused you to reevaluate the meanings of specific works of art? That's coming from oh. Georgina. Well, that's that, that's a really good question. Yes, I think it has, and I think that when you uh, when you look at you know works when you when you realize how the meanings of color change over time, and colors that we might find appealing um, are were unappealing at a given point in time, uh, you begin to realize that those were chosen for a meaning. So, so chosen for a reason. I always, for instance, in, in Giotto's Arena Chapel, I always really admired that picture I showed of the kiss of Judas. It's the most extraordinary confrontational picture. And I always admired that beautiful golden yellow cloak that, that Judas was wearing. But it's only when you look back and you think, well, what did that color mean? back then that you realize that it would have been something that anyone who walked into that chapel before they even saw the picture, before they even saw Judas's face, they would have known that that meant he was not to be trusted. So I think that, yeah, when you start to think about how meanings of color change over time, it, it's, it's inevitable that uh, it, will, it will change your response to the pictures. Yeah, I think it does unlock something in the way that you, you can look at art, the more you know about color and their potential meanings. It makes me think about, there's a scroll, um, a Chinese scroll that shows um, the emperor on this journey. It's a Southern tour and all of these things. Mm. And you can immediately find him mm. because he's wearing yellow and that's the emperor's color. So once you have that context, it just unlocks that you know little bit of information, which I think is really interesting. Yeah. Um, one another question, this time from David. Uh, it was interesting to hear your views on the relationship between the centrality of red in art and the earth. Can the links between our biological reactions to color and our use of color in art be quantified? I'm not sure if they can be quantified. Um, I think that it's, um, it's certainly true that some of these connotations seem very deep rooted. And this is one of the things I tried to talk about in the book is that obviously in some ways, meanings of color are ever changing. Uh, they're, you know, there's, they're, they're not universal, they're not uh, consistent, they're constantly on, on the move. And yet we also see these, these, these particular kinds of associations and correlations 
just sticking around. And so one is that, yeah, that connection between red and blood. You know, you see it from the start. It sounds like a cliche, but that's because we it, it's it's so hardwired. We see it from those earliest cave paintings all the way through to, you know, if you look at Schindler's List or, uh, or American Beauty or um, uh, Alfred Hitchcock's film Marnie, blood, that, that symbolism of, of red as blood is still the case. The same is true of black and darkness. We see it very, very early on in human society. We still have it today, even though, as I say, black and darkness are not the same thing. Uh, so I think that there are certain deep-rooted uh, connotations that I wouldn't want to quantify them, um, but I but I do think they are they they are hard to ignore. There does certainly seem to be something to it because you find that hospitals are sometimes painted in certain colors. Um, fast food restaurants often use similar colors. Mm. If you go in on the cereal aisle, the boxes might use. So there must be some kind of physiological response. Yes, I mean, well, that's definitely true. I mean, there's certainly there's certainly true that lots of studies have found that, for instance, um, that red and yellow are appetite stimulants, and so that's why a lot of fast food places will have red and yellow signage because it's more likely when you see it to think, "Oh, I want to eat." They've also found um, that blue is associated with stability and loyalty. And so therefore we often see banks, financial service companies choosing to have blue. Purple is often associated with extravagance. And so if, if, if brands want to present themselves as luxurious, you know, whether it's Liberty or whether it's uh, particular chocolate companies, then uh, purple will be the color they go for. We've also got studies that, um, that, you know, people are more likely to trust a doctor if they're wearing white a white coat, even though we know now that white coats are great carriers of disease. And that's why at the NHS, for instance, doctors aren't allowed to wear white coats. Um, I didn't know that. <laughs> it's a, well, it's only because people weren't washing their, doctors weren't washing their white coats regularly oh, enough. Um, okay. So that's why the NHS guidance is no white coats. But people prefer to be told information by a doctor wearing a white coat. We also but know it also actually, causes fear for some people. There's a, yes. they call it white coat syndrome. Yeah, yeah there, is, there is fear. There's also trust as well. And yeah. when you talk about the color of hospitals, another study found that um, people are believed to recover more quickly from surgery if they have, uh, if they're either in green rooms or have access to, or can see green uh, vegetation, green trees, green landscapes outside their, their windows. So there are these interesting studies. I think we have to take some of them with a pinch of salt, um, but I think there is certainly something in them. I think we've got time for just a couple more questions. Um, this uh, Jay Peak says, have you explored musical tones related to certain colors as with synesthesia? Uh, my experience is that those affected see the same tones per color. Well, I mean, Ferrin, you'll probably know more about this than I do, because you did a fantastic podcast on the on the subject. But I think that it's certainly true that people have linked colours and music uh, many for for a long time. I mean, the most famous example is Kandinsky, of course. Uh, Vasily Kandinsky could hear colour, he could see sound, he had particular correlations. Uh, that he thought, for instance, a cello sounded dark blue, I think, and a violin uh, sounded pale blue. There's a, there is one study that showed that many people think of trumpets as red, although I don't think of trumpets as red, but that is uh, supposed to be something that lots of people think of. Um, synesthesia is obviously a fascinating phenomenon. I think actually most of us experience it on, to a lesser degree, but then of course there are wonderful writers and artists who are able to exploit it and make something from it. Yeah, I think it's interesting as well that that it kind of has infiltrated art history synesthesia because with Kandinsky, he started making what he called compositions, right, from mm. hearing music and then he would make these paintings and he called them compositions, borrowing the term from music. And now it's quite normal to talk about compositions of artworks and things like that. Mm. So it's quite fun. Um, synesthesia is really interesting. I. I don't have it, but I find it really fascinating, especially people who have it with like tastes and yes. things like that. Yeah. No, it could be if you if you had it quite strongly, it could be a bit burdensome. Yeah. Um, we've got 
Uh, another, one last question, and I'm gonna combine two questions here. Um, one of them was, what is your favorite color? And the other is, if you could only see one color for the rest of your life, <laughs> what would you choose? Well, um, I mean, I think that I'm extremely unoriginal in this, and I would say that my favorite color is, is blue. And as I say, that's what many, many people think. But is it just uh, regular blue? You know, is there is there a specific? I think shade? I think give me an ultramarine. I generally like the deeper the deeper tones of every color, the richer tones of every color. But deep deep ultramarine blue, and that, and that's the blue that has a slight violet tinge to it. Uh, not yeah. a greeny blue. I don't like a greeny blue. Um, <laughs> although you know, turquoises and eggshells and lovets and those kinds of colours are wonderful, but I don't like a sort of, I've never liked Prussian blue, which is a kind of dull greeny blue, but yeah. a beautiful violety blue, I think is a really, really desirable experience. There, It has a depth to it. it you feel like you can fall into it in a way that uh, mm. you can't with other colours. Um, blue recedes from the from the eye, so some are, some colours advance towards us. Yellows and reds advance to the eye. Uh, blues and purples recede, and I think actually that that that, that uh, a colour that sort of draws you into it in that sense, I find particularly appealing. So yes, blue would be would probably be my choice. But as I say, thirty to forty percent of people would choose would make the same decision. Uh, yeah, I have to admit I do really love ultramarine blue. I also like ochre. I think yes. ochre is a really, it has a similar, uh, gives me similar good feelings as when I see the, the ultra moon. Yeah. Um, and then if you could only see one color, that sounds pretty intense. Like, I don't know if that sounds. <laughs> I'm not sure. I think I maybe I'd go for something like grey. I, mean, I, I wonder if if you go if you can have shades of grey. And um, we're so yeah. used to seeing the world, seeing seeing things through black and white photographs, black and white films, that perhaps it would be less unsettling than uh, than seeing the world in only one other colour. Um, but obviously, if well, what, could... a, what about just wearing one colour? Maybe that seems more like if you could only you know wear one colour, decorate your house. You know, my house is blue. I have a blue. What's the song? <laughs> if you if everything was one color that you used, what would you go with? Oh, I think black, black or gray, probably. I we recently renovated our house and we went for a we we went for a sort of murky mid tone gray. I'm ashamed to admit, and I'm, I I do quite like it because you don't really almost you don't really notice it. So maybe gray or black. Yeah, I think if you wear black all the time, you, you could you just chic then, right? Yes. So everyone's like, oh, very artsy. <laughs> well, that's the other thing about black, actually. Although it has these these negative connotations going back thousands of years, of people thinking of it connected to darkness, it, it did emerge, particularly in the early 20th century, as the most chic colour and the, sort of, the colour that was somehow timeless and stylish. And we still use that phrase, you know, X is the new black again and again that's and again. That's true, yeah. I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to uh, have this conversation with me. This is so interesting. I hope everyone has enjoyed this as much as I have and had your questions answered. Don't forget to click that link above to uh, buy the book because uh, James does talk about these things and more and in greater detail. And there's so much pop culture and art and so many things discussed in the book. It's really interesting. So thank oh, well, you thank so you. much. Thank you, Farron. And thank you everybody for, for, for listening in on a Friday night. Yeah, good times. <laughs>